while, coronavirus is uh, coming on thick and fast in some places around the earth. Here in Oklahoma, it seems like uh, we're avoiding it for the meantime. And um, all sorts of precautions are uh, taking place all around the, uh, the, the earth. Um, at OU, of course, we're uh, getting into this mode of online teaching. So for the first two weeks, at least after the spring break, We'd, we've got a designated time of online uh, teaching where there's no classes. Uh, what's going to happen after that, I could guess, but uh, I won't say for certain what I think will happen, but it's possible that we'll just carry on for the rest of the semester online. So we're preparing for that. So a lot of people uh, have not been geared up for that. So there's a whole lot of work going on right now. And people are, maybe some people are panicking a little bit. Uh, as far as myself, I have three classes already which are online, so I'm kind of used to that, so it's not, it's not a big deal to me. However, it's still, still there's a lot of work you have to do to get things ready. So uh, the students have to adapt, and they are all worried about you know, what's going to happen, how are we going to take exams, and so on. Taking exams online is a problem, and there's ways uh, of mitigating against cheating and things like this. But nonetheless, I think a lot of it is goes down to the honor uh, of the students and that they can restrain themselves from taking the easy way out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Well, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today, Lord, for the <coughs> opportunities that come our way, Lord, to open the Scriptures. We pray for each one here that they'll be safe and healthy. We pray for the nation, Lord, that You would restore it to the roots of the constitution lord and uh, we pray for those in places of leadership lord that they make good decisions as they consider the state of uh, the union and also the state of the world in christ's name we pray amen all right now we are moving through uh, some very interesting things so let's go to genesis chapter 6 right now genesis 6 so genesis uh, 6 um, we are going th through these chapters 6, 7, and 8, and 9, which basically lead us through this troublesome time of um, how it was that there was this deluge that came on the earth and the events that led up to it. Um, we know um, that, for example, when you look at the scriptures, uh, you find this passage, which, which really is very significant. Uh, as the days of Noah were, so shall, it all, sh so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then it continues on and gives some very interesting indications of the kind of things that are going to happen. So in Genesis uh, chapter 6, we have this said, in verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And this expression, sons of God, if you look at the uh, book, which is known as the LXX, which is uh, the 70, the LXX, L for 50, X for 10, the 70, um, that is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. And um, if you look at Genesis uh, 6-2 in the Alex X, what you find is that the way that they translate the sons of God here is the an angels. The angels. And if you go through uh, Job 1 6 one 7 Psalm 29-1, uh, Daniel 3-25, you'll find that this expression, sons of God, is often in context, meaning the angels, angels. And so this whole business of how angels uh, came into the affairs of man through some sort of um, uh, manipulation of the genetic code by some sort of cohabitation with women is a very interesting thing. And it's an interesting thing because we have in archaeology, all sorts of remnants of things that we, we can hardly really explain. The size of things, the size of um, skulls, the size of all sorts of things that, that men and women made in time past. 
And it says this um, in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. And we discussed this 120 years as a con the continuation from Adam uh, in his days. Now, uh, the point I'm trying to bring you to is this action of the uh, angels. Okay, so in uh, Matthew 24, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the coming of the Son of Man is, a base, is the prophetical thing. It's the thing which uh, the prophets talked about, the coming of the Messiah. The nature and coming of the Messiah is a huge topic of the Bible. So that in the Old Testament scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find prophets which would talk about the coming of Messiah. And uh, we have further elaboration right here in Matthew 24. Uh, but as the days of Noah were, so, also, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, the, the business here which I'm trying to bring you to is the nature of angels. That there was an angelic activity in the past. And leading up to the judgment on the earth, there was the way in which the angels came down and, and that they somehow cohabitate with, with women and produce offspring. These were people of renown. Well, so it should be also that in some way there's going to be angelic activity uh, leading up immediately to the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, here comes the complicated part. Okay, now I'm trying to show you the the issues that we are facing, I think, as people who seek to uh, rightly divide the word of truth, as we've got here, uh, right there on the pulpit, um, which, of course, being here, it's a kind of an important thing, isn't it? Uh, show yourself approved unto God, workman that needs not be shamed. And then it says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth uh, comes from uh, this participle orthotomunte uh, and the thing about this is you can see in here there is this orthos we see that word in things like uh, uh, orthogonal right angles right right and then this tomunta part comes from a, a verb which is I'll write it with the O here. Temno, which means to cut. To cut. Okay, so basically this is, the idea here is correct cutting. Correct cutting. So when you have something and you cut it, you immediately divide it. Implied in the idea of a cut is some sort of a division. You cut, you divide. And so you have this translated rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, what, what am I saying this for? Well, I'm emphasizing this because at some stage, there was given uh, the revelation of the mystery to Paul the prisoner. Okay, so it was given to Paul the prisoner. And with this giving of the mystery came a new dispensation, right? A dispensation, what is that? That's the household rules. The rules get changed here. And we've we got we to gotta look for this, right? So some rules here, the rules get changed of how the household would be run here because it goes with a new hope, a, a new dispensation given here which relates to a new age. Okay, so there's a new age, there's different rules for that new age and it's the Paul the prisoner that was given this. So now here is the complexity, right? This is, this is the complexity I want you to see. On the one hand, you have the coming of the Son of Man as given in prophecy. And these days in which this would occur were likened unto the days of Noe, which involve all these things to do with the angels and all these events. But then another age begins because Israel says, no, we will not have this man to rule over us. And finally this comes to fruition. And judgment comes on Israel, and their temple is finally destroyed. Do you remember the passage we just finished reading in Second Thessalonians? Well, the temple's up and running there. Do you notice that? The temple is up and running. 
When Antichrist comes, he enters into a temple which is up and running. You notice the state of the temple at the moment. Well, there is none there, right? There's no temple there. There's no way in the wide world that prophecy can be filled today. It's not there. There is no place for the Antichrist to go into, right? There's some things we can say for sure about prophecy. That prophecy cannot take place today. It can't happen. Okay, well, does that mean it's not going to happen ever? No, it's going to happen because there's time going to go through. So the, here, is, here is the issue. There is some prophetical time re which relates to the coming of the Son of Man, and these relate to these last days of that age, of that age. But then suddenly what happens is God says, yeah, bro, you won't have my son to rule over you. All right, then I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to divorce you for now. All right. And when you repent, I'll clean you up so that you'll be as good as new so that I can marry you, not again, but as it were, a new bride, so fresh and new. See, there's a law that says, if you divorce your wife, you cannot take her back. You can't do that. But the cleanliness and the completeness of the regeneration that comes through Jesus Christ means that that bride is made completely new. And God then can take her back. Okay, so now a new age begins. Well, if a new age begins here, shouldn't there be some last times of this age? Well, yeah, there is, right? There's some last times of this age. Okay, hmm. so we had an age that was running, and it, it even got into the last days of that age. And then it was abruptly stopped with a revelation given to Paul the prisoner, and then this new age is going to run, and Paul talks about the end times of this age. So this age is going to end. Well, wait a minute. If this age is going to end, is going to have some last times of this age, then the last times of this age ought to, ought to be coincident with the starting up of the age which it interrupts. Do you, you get the point I'm saying? Here is the age, right? This is the age which was of prophecy. Okay, so here's the prophecy. And prophecy's running on, man. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul goes out, Jew first. He tells people, don't get married. Why? Because the last days are right here. The last times are here. This is a time, a great distress. Don't get married. He's right at the door. And what happens is there's a condition. And the condition is, Israel must repent before Christ can come. And what happens is, no, they won't repent. And then what happens, I'm going to just shoot, cut our age, you know, make it short so we can see this thing. Okay? So, you know, here's our age. Here's our age begun here. Our age will come to an end. It will have some last times of our, our age. And then what's going to happen? Well, this, is, this age here then, when it ends, the, the former one will continue. The former one will again begin. But wait a minute. The former one will begin where it left off. And where did it leave off? The last days. The last days of that age. So when this one begins, it begins not with a nice fresh start. No, no. It's got to begin where it left off. Well, how can that be? Well, that means that the way that this age has got to end has got to be somehow presumptive, right? It's, it's got to be some sort of resumption of what went on before. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. If you go across to one of Paul's epistles, so just go across this. This is 1 Timothy. These are, these are important doctrinal ideas, which you've got to get right, I think. And I'm following a guy who is on YouTube who is he's progressively starting to understand these things. It's very interesting to watch his progression. And um, he's, he's a very down-to-earth guy, and he's trying to be very plain about what he's saying. This is 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Look at it. It says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, oh, well, wait a minute. Paul 
he is the apostle to us and he's speaking to us in our age and then he says that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. Now we're starting to see action of spirits coming to, coming to part. When? At the end of our age. And, and when our age ends, what happens? Well, the former age begins with what? Where it left off. And how did it leave off? It left off with a lot of spiritual activity. And we know that th those days were likened to the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, man, there was angelic activity. Now, wait a minute. We, we know, we know, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to move into an area which is, you know, my opinion. Okay? So I'm going to try and be plain. This is my opinion. My opinion is that if you look what's going on with all sorts of places, um, there's, there are places on this earth which have very strange things going on. Spiritual activity like you, you wouldn't believe just to, if you just read about it you would hardly believe it there's enough witnesses to say that something very strange is going on uh, some parts of Utah for example there's there's places in there where there's all kinds of weird spiritual activities going on which the Indian peoples knew about and they wouldn't go near these places uh, places where there are UFO activity for example and there are all kinds of manifestation of the spirits uh, so when you see, for example, these, you know, UFO types things, and people talk about them and say, well, these are coming from another planet, I think that's bunk. I do not believe they're from another planet. Are they extraterrestrial? In the strictest sense, yes, because they're not from this world, right? Now, when I say not from this world, I'm talking about originally. It may, in fact, be that they have bases on this earth. We know from the book of Revelation that things come out of the earth. We know Paul talks about things that are under the earth. We know that there are creatures bigger, bigger than we can possibly imagine in their powers, which we commonly call angels. Well, there's seraphim. There are cherubim. Do you think these are not real beings? Of course they are real beings. These are real beings. So right near the end of this age, there's going to be spiritual activity and it's of deception. Now, people will be deceived by these things in all kinds of different ways. Just in doctrinal ways, yes. But what is a doctrine? It's just a teaching. And you'll, you'll, you'll get these things manifesting in all sorts of different ways through people and their false teachings. And so it will continue. Once this age ends, so you'll find it continu continuing on, which is where this age formally continued. Okay, cool. Now, so if you look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, it says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And now look what it says, forbidding to marry. Well, isn't that interesting? Forbidding to marry. Do you remember what Paul said back in the former days? In the former days, back here in the, in the time of the book of Acts, he, he told people, well, you know, it's a stressful time. My advice is you'd be as me. Don't get married. Why? Because the time is coming to an end and you've got a, a quick job to complete. All right? Now he's saying the idea of people commanding not to marry is a doctrine of the devil. You see, if you don't rightly divide, if you don't rightly divide Paul's ministries, you're going to have a lot of trouble here. A lot of things are cleared up if you understand Paul's ministry. So Paul had a ministry here and he had a ministry here. And the more you can clarify his ministries, the less trouble you're going to be in. Look at this passage with me. Go back to the book of Proverbs. Oh man, I'm just, I'm just getting warmed up here and looks like I'm already on a rabbit. Okay, these rabbits... They're interesting little critters. Uh, Proverbs 3. Look at this. This goes on a lot of people's walls. And it's a great passage. But I want you to see here, like I told you, in the LXX, it translates this with uh, a Greek word, which is orthotomunta, 
the participle. It says this, uh, verse 5. This is Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Cool, man. That is absolutely right. What we need to do is ground our understanding on the Scriptures, and we always say this, rightly divided. Watch this. It says this, verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, do you see that in Proverbs 3, 6? Direct, direct thy paths. That in the LXX is orthotamunta, rightly dividing. Oh, wait a minute. Look at the word direct. Isn't that a cool word? Just look at this word. Direct, direct, die to. Two, rect, rectangle, right, direct, rightly dividing. You see, in all thy ways acknowledge him. And then what did he say? He says this in verse 6. And he shall rightly divide thy paths. And he shall rightly divide thy paths. You see, right division is not just something up here in the head. Yeah. We, we see a lot of heady things going on here, but it comes down to paths, man. It comes, it comes down to this, man. Which path are you going to take? And unfortunately, a lot of Christians have taken the wrong path because they have not seen the right division of Scriptures. And they've come to a path, man, and they've come to this path in the road, and they see the book of Acts, for which you find the book of Romans was written, First and second Corinthians, Galatians, Hebrews. These, epist these epistles here were written during the book of Acts. And what they see in here is signs and wonders. And what they've done is they've, they've heard some preacher in the pulpit saying, Yeah, man, and you can have them too. And you can have them just like the apostles had. And then they've taken this path, man, not being filled with the Spirit as the apostles were, not with the will of the Father as it was in the book of Acts, and now they're trying to force signs and wonders into their lives. That's what they're doing. And they'll take passages from the book of Acts, that is, they're going to take some of Paul's words during the book of Acts to justify their teaching right and what they end up doing is as Paul warned they're taking a doctrine of a demon you say how can that be yeah. see that this is what I'm saying it comes down to something quite practical quite practical when we're talking about right division we're not just talking about man I'm superior to you because look how much knowledge I have nothing to do with that nothing all we're trying to say is if you don't get Paul's ministries, then you as a human being, you're open to being deceived. I'm afraid you, you are just simply open. I was, myself. I'm not pretending to be all knowledgeable. There's plenty more things for me to learn. But I'm telling you something. This issue, if I didn't get this straightened out, I'll have to say this. I'll have to say this. I'll be very close to just saying, man, I've got better things to do. I've got better things to do than trying to force scriptures and play this game of trying to, you know, m put these round pegs into square holes. You know, just not going to do that. So this is, this is kind of important. Let's go back to Genesis, right? This is cool, man, I'll tell you. This is some of the stuff which, you know, I think we've got to clarify. We've got to clarify. We don't do a good enough job of clarifying this. So the days of Noah, well, that's kind of cool. If you go on down, I want you, to, want you to compare a few things. Look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Okay, look what it says. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. 600. Now, numbers, I think sometimes we go off on numbers, and uh, we can magnify numbers as sort of, we use them in any way we want to use them. But I, at the same time, I think you've got to see that there are some special numbers that are appearing here. And it'll be, 
You'd have to be sort of, sort of blind not to see that God is trying to say something through numbers here. 600. Look at chapter 7 and verse 12. It says, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Forty days and forty nights. Mm, that's desert wanderings, right? Desert wanderings. Six hundred. Six on the sixth day God created man. Six is associated with man. Six hundred. Okay. Then he goes on in, in chapter 8 and verse 4. Look at this. It says, And the ark rested in the seventh month. Seventh month. That month is known as Nisan. Nisan. Not a Nissan or a Toyota. <laughs> Nisan. Okay. It says Nisan. And then it says, oh, the seventh month, which is Nisan. On the 17th day. So it's Nisan. That's seventh. And seven is complete, right? Perfection has occurred. On the seventh day, God rested. That is, he, he stopped doing his activities of creation on the seventh day. And you get this completion that's occurred. And that's the month Nisan. When Israel came out, it came out under the Passover, which occurred on the month of Nisan. And then God says, this shall be a beginning of months for you. It's a start, right? And it says, okay, on the 14th, Wait a minute, that's two sevenths. That's when the Passover occurs. Now wait a minute, what does it say here? It says on the 17th day. 14, 15, 16, 17, three days. Up from the grave, here, right? All this stuff. Resurrection. New beginning. Resurrection is here. Okay, you say, well, you know, that's just, just your interpretation there. Uh, well, I don't think so. Have a look at 8.13. Have a look at this one. See if I can convince you. 8.13. It came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month. The 600th and first year. 600, six with man. First year, first month, first day. Oh, man, come on. You're not seeing the number one in there along with six. You must be blind in one eye and can't see out the other. All right? It's pretty clear that it's there. And therefore, we're getting all sorts of pictures here of the nature of the beginning under Noah. So you have the days of Noah... Tremendous days of judgment coming on the earth, uh, apostasy falling away, and then these eight souls saved by water. Yeah. And then starting it fresh again on the other side. But what does it say about that now? It says, and also after that, and also after that. You see, the millennium which this pictures is not a time of total perfection. And even in the picture of the Genesis account, it talks about the eruption of the angels again, right? And also after that, after the time of the judgment of the flood, there's going to be a great tribulation on this earth, right? And it's going to involve angelic beings. But after that, there's going to be a time when Christ will reign right there in Sion. But... That doesn't mean to say that all throughout the earth, everything's perfect. In fact, that age ends with total eruption again. A great big battle occurs again at the end of that age. So you see this microcosm going on here in Genesis with the numbers. And look over here in Genesis 6 verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, his genealogy. And Noah walked with God. Just go back to Genesis uh, 5 and let's see, verse 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So notice the taking, the taking. Enoch was not taken in judgment, right? 
He was not removed in judgment. No, 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 no. Quite the reverse. Right? Now, if you just go across here, let's just go across to Matthew 24. Let me just show you this again. Uh, this is really cool stuff. So Noah was taken and his family, right? He was taken in the sense that he was preserved from that world. Matthew 24. Have a look at this. And verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. Now, it's interesting in the context of the previous verse, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding in the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. You see, the thing about this is that those that are taken will be just like as Noah, just like Enoch, just like Noah. They'll be taken away and preserved. And then the ones that are left will be there for judgment. You find this, for example, if you go across uh, again to uh, the book of uh, uh, let's see, go across to 1 Thessalonians. Have a look at that with this with me. So in uh, 1 Thessalonians, we have a tremendous passage here. It says this in verse, uh, this is chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Whoa, wait a minute. The voice of the archangel. The archangel. Well, Michael is the archangel. Michael stands for whom? Well, Daniel tells us who he stands for. Michael stands for the nation of Israel. And it says this, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, that's the trumpet, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. They go to meet the Lord. They leave. They're taken. Right? In the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And what does the Lord do? Well, he's on his way to the earth, according to prophecy. And he's going to come in through the east gate, and he's going to go into the temple, which will be there. And there he will go. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, what has happened in Christianity is that the hope of Israel, which Paul has given in this time, which by the way isn't here, Paul has been instructing the nation of Israel about things that are, are associated with the last days of Israel. And what the church has done is it's gone in here and grabbed these things and grabbed the hope which is associated with Israel and taken it to themselves rather than going across to this man, Paul the prisoner, and understanding the fresh doctrine that was given to him for us in this age. And they've bypassed it. It's as if it's not even in the Bible. It's as if you can just take that age away and just keep on reading through. Just pretend it didn't happen. And take into themselves ideas which are not theirs. We talked about this thing to do with Paul the prisoner. And that's an important thing. The appearing and the coming. And this is the important part I want you to see. In Luke 21, 5 to 12, you have a, a great discussion. Let's have a look at it very briefly. Look at Luke and chapter 21. Luke 21 and uh, verse number, uh, let's see, verse 10. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Verse 11, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilences, fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from heaven. This relates to the tribulation. 
But look what he does next. And this is, I've said this before, but I want to say it again, because it's a very important doctrine here. But before all these, so before all these, so he's going back before those signs that are associated with the tremendous tribulation. He says, the, the great end of the tribulation, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now notice he's talking to the disciples. Notice he says, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you. You say, well, wait a minute, that's, it just means anybody. He's instructing the disciples. And then look down here, you can see the difference. And down, down in verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming. That's in the third person. There's they that shall see the Son of Man coming. But up here, it's you guys. Before all these things, you guys. What, what shall happen to you guys? It says in this, in verse 14, Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. Oh, wait a minute. Don't worry about what you're going to answer. You know, man, do you ever get in that kind of bind? All oh, I'm worried about what I'm going to say at this interview. <laughs> you know, they're going to ask me some real hard question and I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a, give a good answer. Jesus' statement to them is, don't worry, man, don't worry. For I, well, verse 15, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Do you know that this doctrine is completely backed up again in 1 John 2, 27 and 1 John 2, 20? Yeah, it's backed up completely. Don't worry about what to teach. Right? You'll know. You'll know. That's what John says. This particular teaching here, which you find from Jesus, fits exactly into 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, 1st, 2nd Peter, James, Jude. Yeah, you'll find all that doctrine that you're finding here fits in perfectly with what's going on there. Now, when you read through Paul's epistles, what you'll find here, see, these are some examples of the time that was then present. And I, I won't spend too much time here, but just to point them out to you, right? Just very quickly. Just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me. I think, you know, if you can see how the Bible is mapped out, man, it makes, it makes a big difference. Because these books... Especially these ones. These are really problematic for, for people. They are problematic, man. There's an unction of God there. James, for example, talks about, you know, this business of anointing people with oil and all this kind of stuff. And associated with this, all kinds of prophecy, prophecy coming to, about. If you anoint people in prayer, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. That's what James says here. How can he say that? Do you see that happening today? Shall save the sick? How's it going? How's it going, man? If you base your doctrine on this, which comes straight out of what we're reading here in chapter 21, verses 13 to 24, if you base it on there, these things which will happen to the disciples... If you're going to base your doctrine on that, man, you're in for some serious disappointment. I've suffered that disappointment. I have, because for some time I believed that. I was taught that, and I believed that. And I was in for some serious disappointment. Now, some people with that disappointment, what will they do? They'll walk away from Christianity and say, nah, nah, nah. Not right. It's not right. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 to 8. Look at this. What, what am I going here for? I'm going here, friends, because if you read these passages, what you're doing is you're going back into the Acts time, back into Paul, who was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, as was Jesus Christ. Look what he says. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4 to 8. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was 
confirmed in you. Confirmed. There, this ministry of confirmation comes with all sorts of tremendous miracles. So that you come behind in no gift. Waiting. Look at this. Waiting for the parousia. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they were associated with. The parousia. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And associated with this doctrine was miraculous signs and wonders. It's all a part of that ministry. What are we about here, friends? We're about clarifying things. So that you can say, oh, yep, okay, we understand. There was a ministry here. It related to signs and wonders because God was trying to reach Israel. And Israel had to repent. But unfortunately, they did not at the end. If you want to go back here and, and get doctrine back there, my friends, you're in for trouble. You're in for trouble because it's not given to you. It was not given to you. you. You see the point I'm making here. You can't go into the scriptures and just take stuff that was never given to you. Or you're going to get a lot of trouble. Oh, okay. See, uh, mm, yeah, okay. I'm in Britain, right? I'm in Britain. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drive on the left-hand side of the road. Okay, cool. And then when I'm going to cross across the channel, um, yeah, what's going to happen there? You're going to try and institute the same rules there? Sorry, man, when you go across a boundary, rules change. Rules change. Now, in New Zealand, they drive on one side of the road. In America, they drive on the other side of the road. Now, do you think we can just jump off the plane and say, okay, let's play the same rules? Man, we're in for a lot of trouble if you're going to take that kind of attitude. And people are taking that kind of attitude with the Bible. You can't do it, man. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. And when you rightly divide, you get direction, man. Direction. And people are wandering around, Christians, and they're just like, you know, people completely lost. And whoever has the biggest mouth, they seem to follow. And rather than coming to the scriptures and taking the instruction for themselves. Now, we, we haven't got time to go through all these passages. You should do it. Look through these passages here and see what Paul is saying. And if you understand it, man, you're going to see that oh, <laughs> it's not going to fit. We need light, man. We need light. And, uh, you know, I found that out the other day with my flashlight. and Batteries went out. Uh, you know, when it, I went into my... Uh, Hot, the, the, the cupboard where I've got these pressure, this pressure tank, you know. Have you got this problem where every year you're supposed to recharge your pressure tank, you know, for your water system? Well, anyway, we have this problem. It's supposed to be done every year. And if you don't, what happens is you turn the, you turn the water on and all of a sudden, and it starts up and then it cuts off. You put, turn the thing on and it starts up almost immediately because it needs to be charged with, with air, you know. So I went in there with my flashlight to see the pressure because there's a little needle on there. And a flashlight didn't work. You need light, man. And we need good light, strong light. And the only way you're going to get strong light and get enlightenment is you've got to get to Paul the prisoner. You've got to get to him so that you can understand the light that he brings or his ministry brings through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank thee today for this message, Lord, all that we've learned we see, Lord, that it, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Lord, we thank Thee for the light that we have shone on this today. And we pray for the nation, pray for those who are unwell, that You would restore them to health, that they could breathe again, Lord, freely, and uh, take this opportunity that's given to us to receive the light of the gospel, and then run on this race to perfection. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.